Good morning, HCC family. We are so glad you can join us this morning, another Sunday from afar. Uh, we are thankful for the technology that allows us to do this. As so many churches across the world are doing live streaming, I was encouraged as I learned we had people watching from uh, Europe even. Um, so we are uh, just excited to be able to spend some time in, in your morning on Sunday here uh, to just... Uh, Worship the Lord together and look at the Word and encourage one another. So uh, we just want to pause for a moment and reflect on a couple of thoughts as we prepare for our time of worship. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, Peter writes in his epistle, starting at verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That is a praiseworthy thing, something to be encouraged by. And as we just take a moment here to capture our thoughts and our, our minds as they wander to prepare for worship, uh, let's just take a, a, a few moments here to pause and to reflect, to, to meditate on the very thought that once you were not a people, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, that we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's just pause. Thank you, Jesus, for your calling. Thank you that you have redeemed us from the curse of sin and the eternal condemnation that we so deserved. And Father, that is something that we can celebrate. That is something that no matter our circumstances in life, we can come before you and offer praise in the midst of darkness. And we do thank you, Jesus, that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And so, Father, as we gather uh, in this online service uh, this morning, Father, I pray that we would recognize the marvelous light and the glory that you have bestowed on us, that we might celebrate and worship you in our spirit and in truth. And Father, we come before you with all these things, and we praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, Highland Gospel. It's Pastor Stephen here again today, and we're glad to see you. Uh, let's hope that you've got your favorite mug, your favorite spot. Let's go ahead and join in singing some praises to God. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kings and we'll bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise But who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates, lay way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? 
And our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. And our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah, who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? And our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. And our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Almighty is no one. Oh, who can stop the Lord? Yeah, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? There is no one God like you. There is no one God like you. You are magnificent in all your ways, God. I worship You are wonderful, God. You are wonderful, God. So I lift my praise unto your name, O Lord. You are holy. You are holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. 
I You are holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. And I want to see you. To open the eyes of my Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, yes, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, and I want I want to see you high and lift it up to see you high and lift it up We're shining in the light of your glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy holy Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. And I want to see you. Yes, I want to see you. It's our prayer today, God. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, cause I want to see you. Yes, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, oh, shining in the light of your glory. To pour out power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. As we sing holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. You are holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. I want. God, open our eyes. That we would see the wonders of who you are. To see you in your beauty. That you are truly better than anything and everything. God. God, give us visions of you, Lord. Standing in your holy place, God. He who was 
was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold Him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the roaring lion Oh, be still and behold Him He who dined with sinners and saints Healed the blind, the lost, and the lame Even now He is in our midst Behold Him He who chose a criminal's end Paid with blood to settle our debt very death as he rose to life. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him, Jesus. Alpha and Omega, the God, the risen Savior. Oh, be still and behold Him. So holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise holy so holy 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 is the lord god almighty worthy 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 to receive all praise jesus Son of God, Messiah, a lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him, Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion, oh, be still and behold Him, Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior, oh, be still and behold Him. Be thou my will. 
God, we exalt you. Jesus, we look to you. You are our faith. You are our hope. We know that we cannot do this life without you. For you are life. You are breath. So we just ask in your name that you would be our strength moment by moment, day by day. That you would be our vision, that we would keep our eyes fixed upon you. In your name we pray all of this, Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, church, for singing with us. We're going to take just a really quick break, give you enough time to do whatever you need to do, and then Nate's going to come up and give the sermon. We love you, church, and we look forward to seeing you again. In the meantime, keep hope, keep faith, keep loving, and uh, Christ is for us. Amen and amen. All right. I am ready to tell everybody to find their seats. Um, I'm sure that you have found your seat at home by now. Uh, Another week, another online service. Um, I hope this new normal doesn't last for too much longer. Uh, I can tell you one thing. um, I'm starting to wonder if the expression got caught red-handed comes from people who are washing their hands too much as mine are starting to turn red from all the soap and cleaning. Or maybe it's just a statement of fact that I just didn't know how to wash my hands properly before this. Um, Anyway, we are glad that you are joining us this Sunday. We are uh, continuing through the book of Mark. We are coming to a close as we are uh, approaching these last couple of weeks and the last moments of the life of Jesus. Uh, This week, we're going to actually come to his last breath on the cross and uh, pause before his burial, which we'll pick up next week. Um, But we are in Mark chapter 15. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses 33 through through 41 this morning. So Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 41. If you at home would like to join me in standing as we read this, that would be great. Uh, And so we are going to start at verse 33. It says, uh, uh, And when the sixth hour had come, There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and were there also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for a time to just pause in the midst of all the chaos that's going on around us and to meditate on Jesus dying on a cross for us. Father, I pray that as we reflect on those um, moments, those hours, that you would give us encouragement as we carry on through our day-to-day. And Father, I pray that your word would spark hope and life in us, that we might be the church to a world that is scared. And Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. And uh, as we come before you this morning, we yield ourselves to you. And we ask that you would teach us, that you would show us the truth of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to put this story in context like we always do. Um, we have spent a few weeks talking about Jesus' crucifixion and his uh, uh, brutal uh, 
the, the mistrials and the, the criminal behavior of humanity. And as we kind of looked through it last week, we, we looked at uh, the start of Jesus being crucified. Uh, and, and we looked at him being hung on a cross. And he has been, uh, in our text, uh, hanging there for the first three hours in the hands of cruel man. Uh, in all of their mockery, uh, with all of its shame. And this week we begin to plunge into the darkness of Jesus hanging on the cross for the next three hours in that darkness in the hands of God and all that that entails. And so that leads us into our text. And starting at verse 33, it tells us, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. It was the sixth hour. The sixth hour is, is noon. Uh, darkness at noon. Imagine that. In the middle of the day, darkness. And I think it's important for us to understand just what exactly this time is. This is the epicenter of all of human history of all of eternal history. It is the most important moment of history. Everything before points to this one moment. Everything in the future points back to it. It is the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. From the foundation of the world, we're told in Revelation 13.8 that the Lamb was slain at this very moment. From the promise in the Garden of, of Eden, uh, God comes to Adam and Eve after they have sinned and, and fallen uh, into their, their uh, future life of, of punishment for their sin and the, 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 the consequences of their actions. And God comes to them and He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, meaning Satan, and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is pointing to this very moment. And from the end of time, we, we read about how at the end in, in, in the marriage supper of the Lamb and at that moment of celebration, there will be a cry that goes up from, from those, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. It is all pointing to this moment, this very moment in time when darkness covered the earth. And in this moment uh, that darkness had come, it's important to understand what's going on to the best that we can understand it. It is the moment that he is drinking the cup. The cup. It is the cup of God's wrath. It is the cup that, that speaks in Psalm 75, verse 8. In the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine well mixed and he pours it out. And from it, all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dredges. It is the cup that, that is referenced in, in Jeremiah 23 and 25. It is the cup that is mentioned in Revelations 14, 10, and 11, where it tells us he, meaning the, the, uh, the Antichrist, the beast, will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its images. And whoever receives the mark of its name, those who are condemned to eternal damnation, they will drink of this cup of wrath, the wrath of God that is to be poured out. It is the cup that when the two brothers came to Jesus asking, can we sit at your right or your left? And Jesus says, can you drink of the cup that I am going to drink? It is the cup that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that he would not have to partake of, but he declared, I will surrender my will to yours, Father. And somehow in the darkness, he drinks the cup and he suffers and he dies eternally. In the second three hours, we don't see them. We hear a little bit about them, but we don't see them. Is something that happened between the Father and the Son that we cannot see or ever comprehend. In that moment, all of the sin of the world was laid upon Him. He became our propitiation to satisfy the wrath of God. 1 John 
in his epistle, he tells us that he became the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. And in 1 John 4.10, he would later go on, he say that in this is love that God sent forth his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That, that big fancy word, it just means to satisfy, that God looked on Jesus and his wrath was satisfied. And the reason why we are told in Isaiah that it pleased the father to crush the son. in order that God would look on us and be justified in redeeming us. And that great passage in Romans 3, 21 through 26, so rightly called, probably the greatest paragraph in the Bible where it talks about the propitiation by His blood, the satisfaction that is made. The curtain in this moment is drawn shut to us, and we don't get to witness it. We're as though the servants of Abraham who are marching with Abraham left behind on the mountain uh, at the beginning of the mountain climb, and the father and the son go on to take care and settle the matters of sacrifice. The scene is at noon, and it is dark, and, and, and I think it's important for us to understand as, as the critics will come out and say, well, it was probably a, 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 an eclipse, and it can't be, and, and the reason being that if you know anything about a Passover, you'll know that a Passover is scheduled based on a full moon, and for an eclipse to happen, it requires the moon to be on the exact opposite side of the earth as when a full moon occurs, so, it, and it can't just be cloudy, as some critics will say, well, it was just cloudy that this darkness no um, that's silly uh, darkness we're told in mark was over the entire uh, the whole land in in verse uh, uh, 33 here the over the whole land until the ninth hour Luke tells us that it was over the entire earth because the sun went out. In fact, there are many historians that kind of back up this claim. There is a man, a Greek non-believing historian by the name of Thallus. He actually claimed it was an eclipse, but, but regardless of what his claim is, the fact of the matter is, is that he didn't understand the concept of the eclipse here, but he does give credence to the fact that sometime, as he says... Uh, darkness covered the whole land around the year 32 AD. He says, quote, uh, on the whole world, there was pressed a most fearful darkness and the rocks were rent by an earthquake and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. In fact, later on, many Christian historians would actually uh, point to the Romans and say, in your own historical records, there is proof of this great darkness. And the fact of the matter is that it was a literal darkness. It was a very real physical darkness, but there was also a spiritual darkness that occurred. That in that time, Jesus was in the hands of the Father. How did it happen? Was it gradual? Was it instantaneous? Either way, with the darkness, there must have also come great silence. Can you imagine it? You know, all these mockers telling Jesus, hey, you saved others, why don't you save yourself? All of a sudden, darkness must have silenced them. The thieves on the cross must have been silenced. Imagine the scene, middle of the day, nobody's got their candles ready, they're not expecting darkness. You know, whenever the lights go out, when I was, when my kids were younger, when the lights would go out, they would, you know, scream, hey, the lights are out, and, and that's a really bad impression. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the scramble to find light amidst the darkness. We're not just talking about darkness in a house. We're talking about darkness across the whole land. No candles. The priest would have been inside the temple because it would have been the time of the evening sacrifice. And as the lights go out, it makes you wonder, did, did the evening sacrifices cease, at least for a time being, so that the only sacrifice being offered at this very moment was the very literal Lamb of God? It was a spiritual darkness. The darkness of the presence of God coming upon the earth. We read in Exodus chapter 10, 21, that, that when God went before them, it was a darkness that could be felt. And again, in Genesis 15, 12, when God made His first covenant with Abraham, it tells us that a darkness covered him that was filled with dread. 
A darkness that closes every mouth. A darkness of abandonment that was Him, meaning Jesus, abandoned so that we would never be. A darkness of judgment, a darkness of spiritual torment. The principalities and the powers of darkness saw an opportunity and they came upon him to seeking to destroy the Lamb of God. And, and we can kind of get more of a glimpse into the mindset of Christ if we read through that Psalm 22. And in it we are told in Psalm 22 verse 12, the, the writer tells us, Many bowls encompass me, strong bowls of Bashan surround me. And this tells us of, of of an, uh, a picture of these, these uh, raging animals. The bulls of Bashan would have been from a, a, a land of Bashan that has oftentimes been uh, connected with the demonic realm of the, when, when you read that kind of odd passage in Genesis about the sons of men intermingling with the daughters of Eve and, and, and this oftentimes it is implied this, a spiritual uh, thing going on and and so these bulls of Bashan would have been these great animals from, from this land that is connected with this. And there was a king of Bashan named Og, who was a 13 foot tall man, a giant. And where all these giants come from is often connected with this. And so the idea and the imagery is of the spiritual battle that is raging on. And it's all because, as we read in Isaiah 53 verse 6, that in this moment, all of our iniquities are laid upon Him in this very moment. Him who knew no sin, who had never experienced it, who had never known the, 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 the crushing weight of sin because He was holy and perfect and just and had never violated His Father's commands. In this moment we are told, and as Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that in this moment He became sin for us. Your sins were there in the darkness. The sin bearer, the substitute for you and me in that moment experienced the, the, the weight of the full wrath and judgment of God. And in that moment in the darkness, he paid for it. And thankfully, you don't know and you will never know the experience of that darkness and the forsakenness that Jesus endured. And we talk about the isolation of today and how we want to get out and we feel uh, that there's, there's just this tension of, of not being able to go anywhere and feeling alone. And there have been times where, you know, as a family, we get up and we, we kind of walk through our day and we're like just waiting to see other human beings because we feel isolated. Jesus was forsaken in that moment by all and most importantly by the Father. The text continues. In verse 34, it says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's about 3 p.m. is the ninth hour, so after three hours of darkness, three hours of spiritual torment, three hours of feeling the wrath of God's eternal judgment, and, and we can't comprehend what that means to experience eternal punishment, eternal suffering for that time. After suffering the wrath and the cup of God's wrath, notice what the text tells us. He starts out in his crucifixion, Father, forgive them. And he will end with, Father, into my, your hands I commit my spirit. But in this moment, in this great pinnacle moment, he doesn't say, Father, he says, my God, my God. Is a quote from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. In this moment, he is cut off. There is a moment we cannot explain, we cannot understand, and we will never experience as believers. Why? Because he promises us. 
Matthew 28, 20, before he leaves his disciples, he says, Lo, I am with you, even to the ends of the earth. Hebrews 13, 5, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It is an unimaginable moment of terror for Jesus. The Father and the Son had always been together. They had always only because we, we have this understanding of the Trinity that, that John actually tells us in chapter 10, verse 30, that the words of Jesus are, I, meaning Jesus and the Father, are one. They've never been apart. They have never, throughout eternity past, into eternal future, they've never been separated. And yet for some reason, and or for, for one moment, The question is asked, why have you forsaken me? And the answer is, because he is standing in our place. Because as Isaiah also tells us in 59 verse 2, your sins, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. He is standing in our place in this moment. He's standing in our place. How it works, I don't know. But I do know this. Forsaken means abandoned or deserted. He cannot find God's face, the Father's face, for the first time in eternity. Forsaken. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 35 tells us, and some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. Some heard him and they they thought he was crying out for Elijah. How is that possible? Well, I mean, if you think about it, Psalm 22 actually tells us again that uh, the, the thought is, the quote is, verse 15, My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay in me the dust of death. Remember that Jesus has been uh, uh, paraded around. He's had no food or water. He's dehydrated at this time. And, and you can imagine if his tongue is stuck uh, to try and cry out, Eloi, Eloi, it probably sounded like Elijah. It could be that they just simply didn't understand what he was saying. In John 19, 28, we're told then he cries out, I thirst, and and it brings us in. We're going to try and piece this text together with some of the other gospel accounts. And, and, And so then in verse 36, it says, And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine to put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And then verse 37 starts, and Jesus uttered with a loud cry and breathed his last. So they give him something to drink. I'm, you know, I'm convinced that Jesus wanted to make sure it was loud and clear uh, what he was about to shout from the cross. And he utters two important things that are not recorded here in Mark that we want to recognize with his loud voice Two statements. Number one, it is finished. To tell us die. What an incredible statement he has went through and endured. And out of the darkness he cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And and they they give him the drink, and he then muscles up the energy and the strength to shout again, It is finished. For that Roman centurion, he would have understood what Jesus was saying. Because in a Roman prison at the time, if you were serving a sentence, when your sentence had been completed, the guard would then walk down the, the uh, prison until he got to your stall and he would take out a piece of paper and he would nail it to the door and it would say, to Telestai, paid in full, it is finished. These words are incredible words. Jesus had already went through the darkness and paid an atoning sacrifice. He had died spiritually before he died physically. They are words of completion. They speak of the completion of unfinished religious practice. Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers have once been cleansed? 
would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is an annual reminder of sin. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. There was a necessity because the animal sacrifices could not satisfy the wrath of God. But when Jesus paid his price and he declared, it is finished. They are words of completion to wipe away unfinished religious practice. They are words of conquest because they speak of the victory. He had won the victory. Uh, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, talks about death and its sting and the grave and how it would swallow up. But here he comes to a conclusion of his thought and he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. They are words of conquest. They are words of comfort. It is finished. Words of comfort. They speak of the comfort to all who will hear and believe that if we would acknowledge in our heart that as Paul writes to the Romans that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you confess that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and anyone who puts his hope in him will never be put to shame. Paul would also say in Romans chapter 8, who is to condemn except Jesus who has died for you? It is finished. They are words of comfort for all who would believe. So he says those two utterances, he says first it is finished and then second he would say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Remember that the Father has been Away, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And out of the darkness, light comes and he is back. Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I've completed it. It's done. It's finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And the text tells us in verse 37, after he is uttered with a loud cry, he breathed. His last. No one killed Jesus. He gave up the ghost. He laid down his life. He gave himself willingly. No one killed him. Verse 38 goes on and it says, And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Can you imagine that? The curtain torn from top to bottom. Josephus tells us that the curtain was about a hand's breadth uh, thick, which is about six to eight inches, and that it was 55 cubits high. And if your cubit to feet ratio is not accurate, you would, you know, would help you maybe to know that that's 82 and a half feet high. Torn. You know, I remember back in the day, the, the power team that would come in, they'd rip phone books. That's kind of impressive. This was six to eight inches thick material woven together and 82 and a half feet high. It separates the holy place from the most holy place or the holy of holies. The priest would have been inside performing the evening sacrifice. Can you imagine that scene as all of a sudden the curtain's torn and, and the earth starts shaking? We're told in, in Luke's account that there was an earthquake and, and, and the, the, the tombs were opened and, and bodies were raised to life. But here is the significance of this. By this very illustration from God the Father, it is finished. He's passed on. By this, religion is set aside so that anyone can go to God. Hebrews talks about this in chapter 10. The writer tells us, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is His flesh, See, to the Jew and to to those who came to Jehovah, there was always a curtain that communicated a message. Keep out. Keep out. You're not welcome. Your sin 
has kept you separated. And when Jesus dies and declares it is finished, that curtain is ripped apart and a way is made that anyone can go to Him. You don't need a priest. You didn't need a priest anymore. You didn't have to have a priest offer a sacrifice once a year for you on your behalf. You could go to Him. And He is as willing to receive you as He is to receive me. Out of the darkness, He shines the light of life and makes a new way. In verse 39, it continues, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The gospel, you know, this whole scene of Jesus dying on the cross, the whole, the, 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 the thief on the cross, the centurion it is the message of the gospel and, and how clearly it is communicated. It is amazing to me that, that the gospel always goes first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Here we have at the cross two men that come to an understanding, a knowledge of the truth of Jesus. You have a Jew who cursed him and a Gentile who crucified him. The centurion would see Jesus and, and everything that's going on and he would declare truly this was the Son of God. He had seen the brutality. Listen, he was a Roman centurion. He had witnessed many crucifixions. He was, he was callous to cruelty and to blood and to the gore of what went on. And, and he had never seen a man declare in the midst of being nailed to a cross, Father, forgive them. He had probably only ever seen hatred and rage and venom spewed back or, or cries for mercy. He had never seen a man behave and declare what Jesus did. He had never seen a crucifixion where it went black because the sun was blotted out and where there were earthquakes. He had never seen or experienced this. If we sit, as we do in our call to worship, for 30 seconds in silence, we get uncomfortable. Imagine the scene. Three hours of darkness. Silence that could be felt. Then out of the darkness, a man cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He hears Jesus caring for others in the midst of being crucified. You know, you, you think about how the energy that it would be to expend while you're dying on the cross because to speak you had to exhale, which meant you would have to lift your body and, and pull on the nails in your wrists and push up on the nails in your feet just to speak. And in the midst of, of of dying, Jesus would, would speak to the thief on the cross and reassure him of the truth that today you will be with me in paradise. He would reassure and care for his own mother while he is dying. And so we have this Roman centurion who is witnessing all of this that's taking place. And then he hears uh, after all of this, to telestai, it is finished, a phrase he would be familiar with. And then he would feel the earthquake. And then all the, at the last moment into your hands I commit my spirit and he dies if you witnessed all that what are you thinking what does that communicate to you how does that put a, a, an impression upon you it is no wonder that the response of this man could have only been one thing. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Maybe he was there when Pilate had him on trial and his wife comes walking into the room and saying, I had a dream about this man. Have nothing to do with him. He's innocent. Maybe he was there when, when Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. The truth and the reality of Jesus must have hit him and shook him to the core. Did he think, as we rightly should think, that I was a part in killing the Son of God? 
putting him to death with my sin. Mark goes on, he tells us there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph. I don't know how if that's the correct way to say it, but that's all right. And Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Here's what he's essentially saying. Listen, there were women there. There were witnesses that you can... You know who they are. He's writing to this first century church and he's saying, you know these women, feel free to ask them. They were there, they saw it, they witnessed it all. Darkness. And out of darkness, light. Eternal suffering paid in full. It is finished. So what's the application? What is the point of it all? How do we take this and apply it to my life? How do I look at what's going on around me right now and figure out the encouragement? First and foremost, I would say the fact of the matter is this. Without Christ, you go into eternal darkness. That's the reality, the hope of the gospel, that if you are not in Christ, if you have not put your hope and your faith in the reality of what Jesus did in this dark moment, if you have not understood and declared that it is this work of it is finished, that he paid and and was the propitiation, that he was the satisfaction to the wrath of God, that he drank the cup of wrath that I deserve for me. The beauty of the gospel, it's so simple. Repent and believe. Recognize where you stand in your relationship with God. That that as as we already looked at in Isaiah, that your sins, your iniquity have separated you from God. And you need to make payment, a payment that you can never make. And and we have the, the constant reminder. That's why people do good things. That's why people go to church sometimes for the wrong reasons, is to try and wash their conscience, make them feel better about themselves, to give to the poor, to do these things, these various tasks, these, these works of, of what they think are going to uh, fix them, but it never will. And here's the reality, brothers and sisters. Ezekiel tells us that it's not God's delight and his desire to put to death the wicked. It tells us in Ezekiel thirty three eleven that he does not delight in the death of the wicked. And the reality is hell, eternal damnation for those who will not accept and receive this. Oh, it's dark and scary out and you're just going to talk to us about hell. Well, you know what? Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. And it's not because he was uh, demented. It's because he cares. And he warns over and over again. And he enters the darkness for you and suffers eternally for you on the cross so that it can be finished and paid in full for you because he loves. And here is the reality. It is your choice. I'm going to try and do it myself or I'm going to accept and let him do it for me. If you have not accepted the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf and repented of your sin and come to him in faith, don't wait any longer. Without Christ, you go into darkness eternally, where the worm never dies, where the torment and the flame never is quenched. But it doesn't have to be that way because he experienced that for you. Second, I would say this, walk in the light. He has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We read at the call to worship. He has taken us from darkness 
And put us into this light. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes and he says, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Your sins were there in the darkness tormenting as Jesus experienced the full weight and wrath of God. So why, why would we ever continue to walk in darkness? The reason why it is so important that we gather together and even virtually do this, why is it so important? Because we need to encourage one another to continue to walk in the light. Because if you are an island to yourself and you are living to yourself and and we are not encouraging one another, that writer in Hebrews, after he talks about a new and living way, he says, spur one another on to love and good deeds and do not forsake gathering together because we need one another to spur one another on to the light the reality is John tells us in chapter 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus he says this is the judgment that light has come into the world in Jesus and men loved agape darkness more than the light In John 1, verse 9, it tells us that the true light which gives light to everyone was coming to the world because here's the reality. You wouldn't even know what darkness was had not the light of God come in to you because it is God's word. It is God's word that reveals us truth. Paul says, I had not known sin except the law told me. I had not known what was truth. I had not known the reality of who God was. That's the purpose of his word, is that he has come to give us light. And out of the darkness, he has brought us and shown forth his light. And for this reason, we spend time in, in this church. We have as our heartbeat and our focus two main thing, components, the word and prayer. Prayer because it is essential to our communication and our relationship with the Father. Because this isn't about a religious practice. It's about an experience of a personal relationship with God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And we spend time then in the Word because His Word reveals truth to us. The writer of Hebrews again tells us that when we spend time in this Word, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, solid food he's talking about. When we spend time in it, we can have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice. To distinguish good from evil. Walk in the light. Jesus died on a cross so that we wouldn't be in darkness. Why would we ever continue to walk in darkness? And that is really the third application is that we don't live in the darkness. We live in the light of Christ. We should not be in despair. Listen, I get it. Our world is filled with fear right now. And if you are constantly reading Facebook or the news, you're like schizophrenic every other day. I'm I'm upbeat, and then the next moment I'm depressed because I'm like, what is coming? And and we're constantly having a barrage of information thrown at us. We don't know what's true. We don't know what's false, but it's just constantly out there. And here's my encouragement to you. Get off of social media and get in the Word of God. And realize that we walk in the light of His hope. And we walk in the light of His truth. Not in the darkness of a world that is dying. No condemnation for those who are in Christ, we're told. Not anymore. What is the worst thing that can happen to you in this life? Economic ruin? No. Death? No. Because even in death, you close your eyes. And you will open them again and see Jesus Christ, your Savior. Here's the reality, brothers and sisters, that I want you to walk from here in encouragement and in hope. Because we, by the way, have a responsibility to a world that is living in darkness to shine forth the light of His gospel and the light of His truth. And here it is. If we lose everything in this life, we have lost nothing for eternity. Because we have gained through the finished work of his eternal atoning sacrifice that he suffered in the darkness. And we can read this text and find hope and encouragement. And we can go out and face a world and we can walk in the light 
and not in the darkness. And I pray that that will be your call today. And I pray that if there's anyone listening online that they don't know Jesus, that they have no personal relationship with him, that they would consider the darkness which Jesus endured and that they would choose today to go to him and to declare, as Paul so eloquently puts it, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let us walk in the light, not in the darkness, because he has taken our place in the darkness that we should never experience it anymore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel truth. We thank you that Jesus, because of his great love for us, that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die on a cross. And Father, while we can never fully comprehend or even imagine that moment of darkness on the cross, but the matter was settled. And out of the darkness, you came out declaring, it is finished. And so, Father, I pray for anyone here to, that is listening, that if it isn't finished for them, that they would make it finished by submitting themselves to you. And Father, for us, as we walk as your children, I pray that you would remind us of the truths of your word, that we would not walk in darkness, but that we would be reminded consistently over and over again the truth of the gospel that you have died for us and we should no longer live in that darkness, but in the hope of eternal salvation. We thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Church family, we love you. We miss being together with you. And we look forward to the day when we will gather together. We will celebrate together a reunion, a preemptive marriage supper of the Lamb in a form of the church here on earth. Have a great week. We will see you again next week.